Genius of Creation, Chapter 4, God's Glory in Creation, Psalm 19. Psalm 19 reads, The heavens declare the glory of God, Hebrew ale, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words unto the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The Lord of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Here is God's glory in creation. There is no dark side to him. He is the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. All he has made operates by fixed laws. As Voltaire said, I cannot imagine how the clockwork of the universe can exist without a clockmaker. Psalm 19 says, there is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. There is no sound when we view the heavens day and night, but they still speak so eloquently of a Creator. The Apostle Paul cites these verses in relation to preaching the Gospel when he says, So faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the end of the world. In Romans 10. The psalmist, David, is here foreshadowing the time when the gospel would no longer be exclusive to Israel, if it ever really was, but would go out to Gentiles also. And not just during the present dispensation, but also in the kingdom era that will soon dawn on the earth at Christ reappearing. This psalm speaks of the sun travelling, it certainly does, at 156 miles a second, that is 250 kilometres a second, so that one orbit of our galaxy, the Milky Way, takes 250 million years, quite a long time. From earth the sun appears at dawn as if a bridegroom coming out of his chamber or an athlete eager to run a race. Nothing escapes the heat of it. The sun is the source of the earth's energy, while the earth's tilt of about 23.5 degrees causes the seasons which are essential to full food production. Everything about the size of the sun relative to the earth and moon and the distance of the sun and moon from the earth, as well as the tilt on the earth's axis, is a unique phenomenon that testifies to the incredible skill of the Creator. This surely did not come about by chance. Psalm 19 speaks of a time to come when angels will sing, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, good will toward men, as we have it in Luke 2 verse 14. Jesus Christ is the sun. His saints are the moon and stars bringing light and a righteous law from Jerusalem to the nations, as it is written, then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, Matthew 13 verse 49. The prophet Daniel says, They shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and as the stars for ever and ever, for the Olam, the hidden period of the kingdom, and beyond, Daniel 12, verse 3. 
Who is she, the righteous saints made immortal, that looketh forth as the morning, clear as the sun, and dazzling as an army with banners? Song of Solomon 6 verse 10 This holy city, New Jerusalem, which is the whole community of immortal saints, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, Jesus Christ, is described as a new heaven and a new earth. This living city has no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did light in it, and the Lamb, Jesus Christ, is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth, the new kings of God's kingdom, Revelation 5, verse 9 to 10, do bring their glory and honour into it. So we read in Revelation 21. In that glorious day, the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea, Habakkuk tells us. This knowledge can only come from God's Word, the Bible. For Psalm 19 continues, The Lord of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them is great reward. Here is the glory of God in his word, reflecting that of his creation, and like the heavens, we too must live by his laws. Continuing the psalm, the psalmist exclaims, Keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. If we are to share in the promised dominion of Christ and his saints over the nations, then we must first exercise dominion over oneself, which is impossible without God's forgiveness in Jesus Christ and his help to overcome temptation. Though Psalm 19 enlarges on creation, it also has an echo of the temptation of the first woman in Genesis chapter 3. Verse 6 of that chapter describes the motivation for her disobedience as The tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. We meet these three points again when David in this psalm refers to the word of God as being sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb, good for food. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes, pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Evolution offers nothing. The Creator offers everything. Atheism has no answer to death. Evolution ends in the grave. So man and woman were created to have dominion in God's name. Although this dominion has been frustrated by sin, it will be achieved in the new heavens and new earth in the future. We can summarise by recalling that the earth was without form and void and covered in darkness. The world of man is also formless, dead in trespasses and sins, Paul says in Ephesians 2 verse 1. But the Spirit has hovered over the waters of nations when holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit from Genesis to Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. The light of God's word shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. This culminated in the preaching of John the Baptist, who introduced the true light, Jesus Christ, at the end of the fourth millennial day from Adam. 
This is the spiritual equivalent of the greater and lesser light, John 1, verse 5 and verse 9. He made the stars also, representing the faithful who have tried to keep the light and truth of God's word shining through the darkness caused by ignorance over the many centuries that have passed. Psalm 104 is a beautiful psalm of the majesty of Yahweh in creation. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honour and majesty, who coverest thyself with light as with a garment, who stretcheth out the heavens like a curtain, who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind, who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers of flaming fire, who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed for ever. Thou coverest it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At thy rebuke they fled. At the voice of thy thunder they hasted away. They go up by the mountains. They go down into the valleys unto the place which thou hast founded for them. Thou hast set a bound that they may not pass over that they turn not again to cover the earth. He sendeth the springs into the valleys which run among the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild asses quench their thirst. By them shall the fowls of the heaven have their habitation, which sing among the branches. He watereth the hills from his chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of thy work. He causeth the grass to grow for the cattle, and herb for the service of man, that he may bring forth food out of the earth, and wine that maketh glad the heart of man, and oil to make his face to shine, and bread which strengtheneth man's heart. The trees of the Lord are full of sap, the cedars of Lebanon, which he hath planted, where the birds make their nests. As for the stork, the fir trees are her house. The high hills are a refuge for the goats, and the rocks for the conies. He appointed the moon for seasons. The sun knoweth his going down. Thou makest darkness, and it is night wherein all the beasts of the field do creep forth. The young lions roar after their prey, and seeketh their meat from God. The sun ariseth, they gather themselves together, and lay them down in their dens. Man goeth forth unto his work, and to his labour unto the evening. O Lord, how manifold are thy works! In wisdom thou hast made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. So is this great and wide sea, wherein are things creeping innumerable, both small and great beasts. There go the ships, there is that Leviathan, whom thou hast made to play therein. These wait all upon thee, that thou mayest give them their meat in due season, that thou givest them, they gather. Thou openest thine hand, they are filled with good. Thou hardest thy face, they are troubled. Thou takest away their breath, they die, and returnest to their dust. Thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created, and thou renewest the face of the earth. The glory of the Lord shall endure for ever. The Lord shall rejoice in his works. He looketh on the earth, and it trembleth. He toucheth the hills, and they smoke. I will sing unto the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. My meditation of him shall be sweet. I will be glad in the Lord. Let the sinners be consumed out of the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless thou the Lord, O my soul. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. 
Day 7. God rests on the seventh day. Genesis chapter 2 verse 1 to verse 4a. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished or completed, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended or completed his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created, better, and made. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created. In the beginning God created. On the seventh day God completed. Here is a beginning and an end which, though literal in Genesis, encapsulates the whole of God's present purpose. What he began about 6,000 years ago, he will complete at the end of the seventh millennium, when God may be all in all, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. Or as Christ says through John, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. Revelation 21 verse 4 No wonder God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Uniquely he blessed the day, not his work. It became a day for worship that was set apart or sanctified from the working days that preceded it. A necessary day of rest for man without which health breaks down. A special day to be spent in spiritual exercises, particularly praise to our Creator and in development of our minds in godly ways. It is this which lifts man above the animal creation to an altogether higher plane. Although the King James translation says rested, the Hebrew word Shabbat means to cease from work. Nothing new appeared on the seventh day. The earth, once formless and empty with darkness upon the face of the deep, is now filled with light, its hills and valleys beautiful with greenery the sea blue and shimmering and everywhere populated with all manner of fish, birds, beasts, and a man and a woman to have dominion. The idea of the all-powerful one re needing rest is not intended. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the Creator of the heavens and the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that hath no might he increases strength. So says Isaiah in chapter 40, verse 28 to 29. The seventh day was not a day of rest in the normal sense, but a day of rejoicing and worship to God by the angels. It was a day of celebration. The morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Job 38, verse 7. Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, to the angels, the earth, and all things that are therein, the seas, and all that is therein, and thou preservest them all. And the host of heaven, the angels, worshippeth thee. Nehemiah 9, verse 6. This worship became the basis for the Sabbath held on the seventh day of the week, our Saturday, under the Old Testament Lord of Moses. The Sabbath was even incorporated in the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labour and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant, 
nor thy cattle, nor the stranger that is within the, thy gates. For in six days the Lord made, Hebrew, Asar fashioned, heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. Exodus 20 verses 8 to 11. The use here of the word asar, do, fashion, or accomplish, rather than bara, created, is significant in that the original pronouncement that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth is not part of the six days fashioning what had begun. Note also that in Genesis 1 verse 8, God called the firmament heaven, for the original heaven of the universe was created, not made, in the beginning, not during the six days. Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Here is the real purpose of the Sabbath. It is a God-given opportunity to cease from one's own work and to immerse oneself in learning from the Word of God and in worship, so that we may be sanctified by the Lord. The word sanctify means to make holy or separate, that is, separated unto God. Exodus continues, Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations, for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made Asa, heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Exodus 31, verse 15 to 17. How long were the seven days? This might seem to be a strange question, but many different suggestions have been made to try to accommodate longer periods of time than would appear to be the case from reading the account of creation in the Bible. Whilst it is true that on occasions the word day can mean longer periods than 24 hours, the context in which the word is found makes clear what is intended. The Bible account says evening and morning, which is undoubtedly a 24-hour day. That the Sabbath day occurred in Israel every seventh day under the law, as we have seen above, confirms this understanding. The further scripture use of the creation week as pointing forward to the kingdom, after six thousand years of the kingdom of men, would also make a longer time for creation week confusing to say the least. The longer period is never used to represent a shorter and it must be said that the independence of all living things precludes the whole hypothesis of evolutionary development. How did vegetation survive long before insects developed, capable of the necessary cross-fertilization essential to plant survival? A short period for creation is an obvious necessity. Do we realise how important this creation record is? Have we considered what effect absence of the account of creation would have upon us? What if the mere record merely said, and in the beginning God created heaven and earth, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field? We wouldn't know what to believe about God and his power. What confusion we would have about evolution and other hypotheses our faith would be immeasurably weakened, and our understanding of what follows in God's word would become similarly limited. 
This creation record is essential to our faith in the scriptures, as it is the foundation of so much that follows. How thankful we should be to the divine author that he has revealed so much to us. Honour him for his greatness, and yet who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Psalm 103 verse 4 Digression The Sabbath as Prophecy from this point, the Sabbath also became prophetic of the coming kingdom of God, when all mankind will cease from sin and serve and praise the God of heaven. Both David in the Old Testament and the Apostle Paul in the New wrote of this time. Paul reminded the Hebrews of the generation of Israel that died in the wilderness on their exodus from Egypt because of their faithless rebellion. The wilderness journey of the faithless to the kingdom in the promised land was not completed. Paul then turns to later generations, including ourselves, and continues. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. And God did rest on the seventh day from all his works, and in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, citing Psalm 95 verse 11. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter into therein, the kingdom in the promised land, and they to whom it was first preached, Israel, entered not in because of unbelief. Again he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, in Psalm 95 verse 7, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Joshua, who led the children of Israel into the promised land, had given them rest, then would he, David, not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest, a millennial Sabbath in the kingdom of God, to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. This from Hebrews 4 verses 3 to 11. So the Sabbath was a type, a pattern, for a future time when the true Sabbath, the kingdom of God, shall come. For this reason, the seventh day is not said to be an evening morning. The kingdom that is coming is not limited by time, but is eternal. The Lord Jesus Christ will be king of this coming kingdom. For when the Pharisees complained that Jesus' disciples broke the Sabbath law, the Lord replied, the Sabbath is made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Mark 2, verse 27 to 28. That is, of the true Sabbath of the kingdom during the seventh millennium. The great lesson of the Sabbath is that creation isn't finished yet. This point was lost on the leaders of Israel in the first century, but not on God's Son, who often deliberately chose this day to work healing among the sick, lame, blind, and mentally afflicted. This is the real spirit of the Sabbath. Even so, the Lord and his disciples were accused of breaking the law of the Sabbath by the Pharisees. In reply, the Lord pointed out to them that David, the great king of Israel, when fleeing for his life from King Saul, had eaten showbread from the tabernacle, which was not lawful for him to eat. Not only so, but even the priests in the temple worked on the Sabbath. In fact, they worked harder on the Sabbath because the number of sacrifices made were doubled yet they were blameless. But I say unto you, says Christ, that in this place is one greater than the temple. 
But had you known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, this citing Hosea 6 verse 6, ye would not have killed the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Matthew 12, 1-8 From this incident we learn that where laws occasionally conflict, the laws that benefit man the most override those that do not. Even though we might be shocked at this understanding of the reasonableness of God's law, we see that sin changed even God's keeping of the Sabbath. He now works on the Sabbath for man's salvation. Our sin has made this necessary. How do we know this? Because the Lord had healed an impotent man on the Sabbath and was reproached for it. In reply, the Lord Jesus said, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. John 5, verse 17. Why? They even circumcised a male child on the Sabbath. How then could they accuse Christ for making a man whole on the Sabbath? John 7, verse 22 to 23. The Sabbath was a day of blessing. One further point about the Sabbath. The keeping of this day as a day of worship will be one of the laws of the coming kingdom of God. For the Lord said that when Israel is restored under Messiah, they shall hallow my Sabbaths. That's in Ezekiel 44 verse 15 and verse 24. There is a change, however, because the law given through Moses was a shadow of things to come. Paul says in Colossians 2 verse 17, In this foreshadowing of the kingdom, the Feast of Tabernacles began on the fifteenth day of the seventh month. During this feast, Israel were to observe the first and the eighth day as a Sabbath. When ye shall do no servile work therein, we read in Leviticus 23. These Sabbaths will not be kept on the Sabbath day, but on the first day of the week. Why is that? Because the first day might be said to be the eighth day of the previous week, which coincides with the first time the Lord revealed himself to his disciples after his resurrection.